Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Good morning. How are you? Y'all glad to be here? Hey, I, I got a confession. Um, I don't know why Jake's picking on me so much, but I could sit on that bench. I'm just going to say that. And I'm not afraid to. Now, six months ago, I would have been, but uh, I'm not afraid. So uh, I'll sit on it. Okay. So, and 80 bucks for a baked potato? Come on. For real? Um, Feel free. Anyway, hey, I'm glad you're here this morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 13. And uh, we've been working through this uh, uh, discipleship, uh, growing in maturity. And we uh, are building this acrostic. So uh, if you guys will put that acrostic up here, kind of uh, review a little bit. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about committed love and uh, what it means to be growing into discipleship, growing into maturity. There's so much of what we call maturity uh, that really isn't maturity. Like some people think you're mature if you come and you sit in rows every Sunday here. And uh, while we love that you sit in rows here every Sunday, that doesn't mean you're mature, right? Uh, Any more than it means you move out of your house and just because you move out of your parents' house doesn't make you automatically mature, right? Because there's some 50-year-olds that still need to mature. Can I get an amen and don't punch your husband, amen? And uh, so it's just, there's this idea of maturity. So we started asking the question, what does it mean to grow into maturity? And so we went back to the words of Jesus, went back, to what Jesus said. If you remember in John chapter 16, he said, I've told you all these things. Well, what are all those things? You go back to John chapter 12 and we find where Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross and he was preparing his disciples that, hey guys, I'm not always gonna be here. So it's time to grow up. It's time for you to be men. It's time for you guys to take the next step. And so he started talking to them about what it's gonna look like and what it looks like for them to grow into maturity. And we looked at that first week, death to self. The second week, hey, if you're gonna be a follower of Jesus, then you got to imitate Jesus. You don't imitate a pastor. You don't imitate a church. You don't imitate somebody else. You don't imitate somebody on the horizontal level. You, you imitate what Jesus did, and he showed us that. And then last week, we talked about serving others. And we, we looked at that story. If you remember, Jesus was talking uh, with his disciples. They were at the Passover meal. They were at that last meal, and Jesus washed their feet. And, and he, he, we, we see where Jesus said, I want you to do the same thing, not literally wash their feet. But if you remember last week, I said that washing one another's feet is a ministry of forgiveness, a ministry of cleansing, a ministry of refreshment, and a ministry of humble service. If you remember, Jesus told those guys last week, he said, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter goes, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus goes, yeah, I have to wash your feet. And Jesus goes, well, hey, if you're going to do that, here's my head, here's my hands. You know, he got so literal on him. And, and, And Jesus said, no, 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 Peter, you don't get it. Listen to me, son. Your whole body's clean because of what I've done. I've forgiven you. 
And so now all you have to do if your whole body's clean is I'm just gonna wash your feet. And, and, and it's that illustration for us that we have been completely saved. We've been completely forgiven. That's the ministry of washing feet. We've already been forgiven. And so Jesus now is demonstrating to us that now I want you to do that for other people. Forgive them, to, to cleanse them by, by, the, by the washing of the word, to, to refresh them. Do people get around you and hang out with you and say, man, that was refreshing. Man, I wanna hang out with that guy. I wanna hang out with that girl. That, that's that ministry of washing feet. And I know some of you in here this week, I got some texts from you. You go, man, pray for me because I, I think we need to serve. We need to serve somewhere. Y'all remember this from last week? Serve like Jesus. How many of you guys are still looking through this? Anybody? Great one. Um, <laughs> I mean, wow. Um, I, thank you. Uh, let's get together after. We'll just, I'll buy you a baked potato, okay? And uh, see if they'd all raise their hands. I would have spent 80 bucks maybe. I don't know. Um, I, we want you to serve. We want you to be a part of it. I, I got to speak yesterday at Cross Brand Cowboy Church. I spoke to over 600 uh, Cowboy Church pastors and leaders and uh, sharing my story and sharing about failure and sharing just what God has done in me over the last four years and, and how he radically changed me four years ago. And as I hung out all day with those cowboy uh, pastors, one, they all look alike, I will say that. Uh, I could not tell any of them apart. And I know that's not right to say, but I'm telling you, they all look alike over there. And um, as I was hanging out though, I, I watched, and it's kind of fun to go to other churches and watch how they serve and that. There was literally an army of people serving these pastors, serving these elders. And I was so blessed and, and because they, they, they were seeing this become a reality. They were washing the feet of these pastors by creating a safe place and an environment. And that's what we do here every week. We do that here in children's ministry and youth ministry and preschool ministry. And, and, and as people pull up on the parking lot and walk through these doors is that we are serving them. So I, I wanna challenge you. I know some of you are already looking at that. I wanna challenge you. Find a place where God wants you to wash somebody's feet. And it may be in here and it may be out there. Well, today I wanna pick up the story. We're in John chapter 13. It's where we left off last week. And so they're still at the Passover meal. They're still sitting there. And Jesus now has uh, come joined them back at the table. Uh, he's now back with them and they're sitting around. And, and if you'll remember last week in the passage, Jesus indicated there was gonna be one that was gonna betray him, right? But he did not tell all the disciples who that was gonna be. Well, John and Peter get together and they decide, hey, hey, you go ask Jesus who's gonna do it. It's kind of like two kids getting together to conspire against a parent, you know? And, and so John and Peter get together and, 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 and Peter looks at John and says, hey, you're closer to him, so why don't you ask him? Because apparently Peter was sitting on the other side of the table and, and John was sitting right beside Jesus. And so they have this conversation. And, um, and, and so Jesus looked at uh, John and, and he's, he's working with them and, and he basically says this. He goes, look, I, I, the, the one I give the choicest mor morsel to, the one that I'm gonna pass this bite to is the one that's gonna betray me. Now, in our day and age, we wouldn't do that. We would toast somebody maybe. We would, uh, to, to distinguish somebody aside. In their day, it's almost like they would give them the burnt ends of a barbecue smoked brisket, amen? You know what I'm talking about? That's kind of this whole idea uh, at this point. So uh, at the moment that Judas and John, along with Jesus, were the only ones that knew what was happening, it is literally, we see this, uh, where Judas leaves the room. Judas leaves the room. Jesus passes him this bit. He gives him this morsel. He dips it in there. And, and now only John, Judas, and Jesus know the betrayer, because you know what Judas did right after this? He got up and left. And that's an odd time to leave because you're in the middle of a meal. And, and that's what the other disciples thought. They thought, man, you know, he's, he's just running an errand because they didn't really know what was going on. They didn't know everything that had just transpired as, as, as John and Peter had already kind of figured it out and they were asking Jesus, there was still food on his plate. But at the moment that door slammed, at the moment that door slammed when Judas left the room, everything changed. Everything changed because in a moment, the room had been purged. In a moment, the atmosphere of the upper room was now clean. 
And the departure of Judas marked a turning point in what Jesus was about to do and what Jesus was about to say. In fact, in John 13, verse 33, look at it. He said this, little children, and he's talking to his disciples, and that was a, it's not, he wasn't calling them kids. It was just a term of endearment to the, how much he loved these men sitting in this room. He said, little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I've said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, several of those guys did not hear a word Jesus said after this. Because if you ever tell a kid you can't go somewhere, you know what that kid's gonna do. They, they're they're gonna wanna go wherever you just said they can't go, amen? And as if we're any different, these guys here, they didn't hear anything he was saying. And, and Jesus was leaving, he was going, and, and you could just almost hear these guys sitting around the table. Well, 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 well Jesus, it, where are you going? And, and why can't we go? And, 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 and what do you mean why I can't go with you? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, what, you, you're leaving us? See, Jesus was their security blanket. Up to this point, wherever Jesus went, crowds gathered. They were almost like little local celebrities. Think about that. It's kind of like being famous in Hawkins. <laughs> Amen? It's kind of having that local celebrity deal, you know? And if you lived in Dallas, nobody knows you, but Aaron Hawkins, you know, uh, everybody knows you. And this is kind of what's going on here. And so they're almost at this point of going, well, well, if you go missing, then what happens to us? And why can't we go with you? And Jesus continued, look at verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give you. You know, they didn't need a new command. Think about it. They had over 600 there that were keeping them pretty busy. And here Jesus is transitioning now that they've, they've, kind, of, they've kind of come to this place where Judas has left the room. He goes, okay, guys, listen to me. Listen to me. A new command I give you. They didn't need another command. They already had 600. They were already doing all they could. And Jesus had already reduced the entire list down there too. Hey, love God and love people, right? And now he's going to add a third. Do they really need a third? Do they really need one more? And by the way, what gives Jesus the right to add to that anyway? What gives Jesus the right to even group and prioritize commandments? I mean, but add to them? Only God has the authority to do that. And can you imagine, here these guys are sitting here and they're going, what in the world? But, you know, God only has the authority to forgive sin, amen? It's God who has the power to give sight to the blind and power to raise the dead. You kind of get the point. Jesus turns to them and he's adding another command to a whole list of commands. He was doing something far more radical than that. Look what he says. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Now think about that. I was telling these pastors yesterday, um, Vince Lombardi used to get up in front of his football team every fall. And he would hold up a football to all these pro football players. You've probably heard the story. You know this. I, I've, I've shared it here, but it just, it, it fits so well right here for, because I, I could almost read your mind. And he would hold this football up to all these veterans and, and he would say, boys, this is a football. Can you imagine a pro football team and the head coach gets up to Tom Brady and looks at Tom, Tom, this is a football. And it needs a certain amount of air. Anyway, um, <laughs> that wasn't right. <laughs> the boys. Anyway, um, it's basic. And here Jesus is looking at these guys. Hey, guys, 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 a new commandment I give you. And you can almost feel them lean forward, right? Love one another. Really? That's all you got? <laughs> new commandment I give you. Love one another. Jesus took a verb and he used it, the imperative form of the verb. In fact, he said, this is a command. It's a command that you love one another. It's not, it, 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 it's, it's basically, hey, hey, go over here and love this guy. That's what he's saying. You got nervous there for a minute, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Hey, go over there and love this guy. It's no longer just come to church. It's no longer just do your religious duty. Listen to me. This is what I'm telling you. This is how you grow. This is how you mature. Get up and go over and love that guy. Get up and go over and love that girl. Come on. Can you imagine Jesus as a marriage counselor? You got a couple sitting there and they're fighting. He goes, listen, listen, stop. Go home, quit fighting, and love each other. Wouldn't that solve all your marriage issues? 
You don't need to go to therapy for six weeks. Stop arguing, go home and love each other. It's an action. Well, I don't want to. Then you're not growing. Amen? I don't like him. Well, love on him a little bit and he might get lovable. Okay, I'm going down a road. I got to get out of there. <laughs> Whew. See, Jesus wasn't commanding the guys to feel something. He was commanding them to do something. Kind of fits in marriage. Kind of fits at school. He wasn't commanding them to, to feel something. He was saying, do it. Go love that guy. And see, loving one another wasn't really new. As it turns out, Jesus wasn't through. He went a step further. And what came next is almost unthinkable, but what came next changed the world. What he was saying to them, and, and he's, he's basically looking at this, and he said, guys, I want you to put this at the top of your agenda. And that's what made Jesus' story so irresistible for those people of that day. And I think it's what needs to be made irresistible today by the way we love one another. And then Jesus says this, look at it. Verse 34, a new command I give you that you love one another even as I have loved you. That's new. That was new in Jesus' day. Jesus claimed to be the gold or the platinum standard for love. I want you to love people the same way I've loved you. Doing for others what one hoped others would do for them is old covenant. In the new covenant, here's what Jesus is saying. Do unto others as I've done to you. He raised the bar. Do unto others as I have done to you. It's a whole nother kind of love. And it was anchored in a person. It wasn't anchored in a set of rules or, or a religious system. It was, it was tethered and it was anchored to him. You see, when we read as I've loved you, we think of the cross. We immediately go, oh yeah, the cross. Listen, they didn't because the cross hadn't happened when Jesus said that. You know what they thought about when Jesus said, hey guys, I want you to love one another the same way I loved you. They started thinking of those stories. Hey, y'all remember that time, Jesus? Y'all remember that time where we were walking along and Jesus loved that woman? You remember that time Jesus was walking along and he healed that brother? You remember that time Jesus, was, I, they, they started thinking of all those stories, those previous three years. And I bet you every one of those men in that room is are sitting around that table and Jesus said, hey guys, listen, listen, listen to me. Hey, here's a new commandment. I want you to love one another the same way I've loved you. I'll bet you that Matthew was sitting there going, I remember the first time I met Jesus. Y'all remember that? And it would have been so easy for Jesus to look at, hey, hey, Matthew, 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 you remember that time we met? Remember that I, I met you and you were despised? You were a tax collector. Your family didn't like you. No, your friends liked you. None of that. And, and by the way, I still called you to come and follow me and I still loved you. Listen, Matthew, now I want you to go do that to other people. I want you to love them the same way. He could have looked at Nathaniel and said, hey, remember that day we met Nathaniel? Remember that? You, you, you were the one that told me, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You offended me. You offended my town. You offended my family. You offended my, my, my livelihood and all my friends. And I still called you to follow me. Hey, Nathaniel, I want you to go, I want you to go love people that way. I want you to love people that way. And he could have just looked at those guys. Hey, guys, y'all you remember that church growth sermon I preached about drink my blood and eat my flesh? And everybody laughed. And everybody started bailing out. And see, even you were thinking about bailing out. And I know that, and I still love you. I still followed you. I want you to go love people that way. I want you to go love people that way. You see, the significance of what Jesus said can't be overstated. It sounds so simple. It's almost like this is a football, right? Love one another the same way I've loved you. You see, in the law, circumcision was the sign of maturity in the old covenant. And Jesus now is saying a new command I give you. This is going to be the sign that you belong to me. This is going to be the sign that you are mature. This is going to be the sign. It's no longer physical. It's now going to be that one another brand of love would be the mark. That we're, we're to love one another in a way that people look at us and go, bam, that's a Jesus follower. Bam, that's a Jesus follower. Right over there. That's him. Changed everything. It changed everything. A new command, a brand of love is supposed to mark the church. In verse 35, he says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love, if you have love for one another. That word, this, is a very, it's, it's a very um, specific word. It's a pronoun, and it's pointing to something very specific 
And Jesus pointed to one specific thing that was gonna be the identifying characteristic for all of us, and that's simply this, the way you love. The way you love. This is a football. I can look at your, some of your faces right now. You're going, okay, I get it. But listen, you can't overstate this enough. And God wants us to love one another. He wants us to love one another in a specific way that you're gonna be known. It's not that you would believe something. It's, it, it's not even insisted they do something. He's just saying, look, guys, I want you to love one another. <laughs> Those guys sitting around that table were probably going, wow, that's it. And they were starting to kind of get an idea and think, wow, well, yeah, okay, I get it. But it was three days. The next day, that Jesus put it on display of what it means to love one another. He put it on display. Because right after this, we know the story where Jesus was arrested and beaten and flogged and murdered, hung on a cross, <laughs> and demonstrated what it means to love and it became a whole new meaning for these guys. He tethered this new command to himself. He inserted himself into the equation. It's no longer about a religious system. That's, that's why we don't claim to be non-denominational or Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or Whiskey Pagans or anything else. We're Jesus followers. And so whatever Jesus does, that's what we do. We don't wanna do anything but what Jesus does. Because Jesus is putting himself into the middle of this equation. You see, the litmus test for being a bona fide Jesus follower is not going to be ritualistic. It's not going to be, hey, y'all come to church more and hey, y'all quit doing this and y'all stop doing that and do a little bit more of that. No, the litmus test of being a follower of Jesus is that you love one another. Isn't that simple? It, it's almost so simple that we're sitting here going... <laughs> I get it. Well, if we got it, then it would change the way we do our Facebook. If we got it, it would change the way we handle social media. If we got it, it might even change what news networks you watch. <laughs> Thanks, hon. <laughs> you see, following Jesus is not looking for ways to get closer to God. But Jesus' followers would demonstrate, and Jesus' followers should demonstrate, our devotion to God by putting the person next to us in front of us. By simply taking the person next to us and put them in front of us. We serve them. Again, you gotta go back to death to self. You can see this progression of where Jesus has taken these guys. You see, Jesus' followers are not expected to look up. We're to look around. We're to look at each other and to be known for loving each other. <laughs> you see, when Jesus did this, he didn't play the God card. It would have been easy because that's what we like to do, isn't it? We, we like to play the power card. You do this because I'm the parent, right? That's what I do sometimes when I can't get my kids to do what I'm gonna do. I can't motivate them with love. I'll just stomp my foot and go, I'm dad, you do it. It's been so easy for Jesus to do that, wouldn't it? How easy would it have been for Jesus just to, hey, Judas, I know you're fixing to do it, so I'm going to kill you. Bam! And never raised a finger. Jesus just could have took his life with just a word. He could have pulled the God card over and over and over again, but he didn't. He didn't even leverage it here. You see, Jesus' love for the men in the room, rather than his authority over the men in the room, is what he leveraged to instruct them and inspire those men to love one another. And listen to me, on a personal note, Jesus' love for us, not his authority over us, is what he leverages to inspire us as well. It would be so easy for Jesus to come into this room and empower and go, you're gonna love her. Dad gummit, Steve, you're gonna love her. And if you don't, I'm gonna strike you dead. Well, it'd change everything, wouldn't it, Steve? Change everything if you're gonna get if you're gonna die. You better obey them. I'm telling you, you don't obey them, I'm gonna strike you dead right now. Yeah, all of a sudden it goes, ooh, man, that's, that's kind of, mm -mm. See, Jesus' authority could have easily been flexed. 
You see, these men in the room would not see him seated, seated, seated on a heavenly throne. That's kind of our idea of Jesus. He's on a throne, he's reigning and all that. These guys the next day saw him on a cross. They saw him on a cross. It was that gory, gritty sacrifice of a man. Talk about a man. It was that gritty sacrifice, not some old covenant, keep your hands clean, compelled. You know, it, it was it, what compelled the disciples is what they saw the next day. And Jesus died for them. That should stop all of us in our tracks to think that God's not up there going, you better follow me. No, he's compelling, saying, I've loved you. Now love each other that way. It's what calls Paul to write a few years later. We read it last week in Philippians 2. I want to look at it again. And verses 3 and 4 sums up in all your relationships with one another. And then verse 5, he says, Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, he never played the God card. He loved those guys. He loved people. He served them. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, not just any death, but even death on the cross. See, Jesus didn't leverage his equality with God to stir us to action. He leveraged his love, his love for the Father and his love for us. He said, listen, people are gonna know you They're gonna know you belong to me by the way you love one another. He anchored it in his love. And so why do we love one another? Because he loved us. And see, I told those pastors yesterday, grace is probably one of the most taught things in church. You've probably sang amazing grace. Know it by heart, you're probably singing it right now. We know about grace. We can teach about grace, but it's probably one of the least believed for ourself of any doctrine that's been taught. Because we know that God is a God of love, but do we really believe that you're fully loved and fully forgiven, not based on anything you've done, not based on how much money you've earned, how many friends you have, just because he loves you. He died on the cross before anybody in this room was fogging a mirror so that we could be fully loved and fully forgiven. That's grace. Because there's not a person in this room that deserves it. There's not one of us in this room. And some of you are sitting here right now going, that's, no, mm -mm. he can't love me. You You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. Well, honestly, you don't know everything I've done. And I've said this before. If you knew everything I've done, you wouldn't let me be up here. And if I knew everything about you, we wouldn't let you in the door. Amen? The reality is, is he loves you. And he died on the cross to demonstrate that so we could be in a relationship with him. And then in turn, he says this, I want you to love people the same way I've loved you. The same way. The same way. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Do you know that the fact that God is love is uniquely Christian? It is. Think about this. No one ever credited a pagan God with being loving or loved. Think about that. All other pagan gods throughout history are jealous, they're fickle, and they jack with mankind. Amen? Isn't that true? You never feel hear another pagan God that's known for love. It is a uniquely Christian thing that Jesus changed everything. See, for Jews up to this point, God was holy. He was separate. He was out there somewhere. And all of a sudden, in the new covenant, Jesus comes along and says, hey, guys, listen to me. God is love. I'm demonstrating love to you. I now want you to be known by the way I loved you that you love each other. Isn't that amazing? It's uniquely Christian that Jesus equates God with love was huge. It was epic. It changed everything. And now he's telling us to go love each other the same way. Andy Stanley wrote in his book, Irresistible, he said, imagine a world where people were skeptical 
Imagine a world where people were skeptical of what we believed. They are, but envious of how well we treated one another. What if people were just, you know, I don't know about that Jesus thing. I don't know about that virgin birth thing. And do y'all really believe the sea split? I mean, come on, do you? I got to tell you, I don't know about all that, but the way y'all love each other, dude, I'm attracted to that. Wouldn't that be good? You know, I don't know about all that. I mean, y'all do that kind of weird stuff and people go and they they get a bath here in church and they drink juice and eat crackers. And I don't know about all that. Why don't y'all have pews? Those chairs bother me. But I'm just telling you right now, the way y'all love one another, that's astounding. That's crazy. What if we're known for that? See, when you grow into maturity, you're not known for what you believe as much as you're known for what you do for each other. It's simple. (laughs) Within that context, pagans of the early church found the way compelling because of the way they loved one another, by the way they served one another. I mean, think about women and children in Jesus' day who were basically property. And Jesus comes along and says, hey, I don't just want you to love men. I want you to love each other. I don't know about all that Jesus stuff. but Here's what I do now. The way y'all love one another, I want some of that. See, ultimately... The way we love one another is tied to Jesus. Yes. It's uniquely tied to Jesus. <laughs> and what that means is, is that we should be the best neighbors, employees, employers, friends, partners, coaches this community has. Everybody wants to be one another, don't they? Do you know there's 59 one another's in the scripture? <laughs> Everybody loves to be one another. I do. I mean, everybody wants to feel included in the community characterized by one another love, don't they? I mean, I want to hang out with people that I I think really love me, don't just want something from me. How about you? That's what we're to be known for. But one another way, the way of Jesus appeals to something that resides in the soul of every one of us. The one another way appeals to our desire to be included and recognized and loved. So what if we just did that? What if we just loved one another? (laughs) I wrote this down on on the front row while I go. You can't one another one another in rows. We one another one another out there. Isn't that amazing? Maybe that was too many one another. So let me say that again for you, all right? You can't one another one another in rows. That's why we do small groups. You one another one another when we get up and walk out of here at our jobs, in our homes, in school. What if we became known for the way we one another, one another? See, that's what maturity is. Maturity, I'm glad you're here. I hope you keep coming back. This is a safe place. But the way we grow is how we love one another out there. So my challenge to you is simply this. It's what Paul said in Galatians 5, verse 6. He said, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts, Paul says, is faith expressing itself through love. So let's go do that. Anybody with me? That's how you grow in maturity love one another. So that's your challenge this week. Church, this is a football. Jesus said, this is a new command I give you. Love one another, same way I've loved you. And that is how men will know you are my disciples. So go do it. Amen? Let me pray over you. Father, I love you. Give us courage. Let's go do it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.